Way one, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Mario Ritter. This program is designed for English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today, Katie Weaver and I report on a movie about the 2017 mass shooting in the city of Las Vegas. Then, Jill Robbins answers a question about the term wild card on Ask a Teacher. Then, listen for part two of our American story, William Wilson. But first, this story about Hurricane Ian developments. Hurricane Ian is heading toward the American state of South Carolina. The powerful ocean storm has already left behind a path of destruction from Florida to the island nation of Cuba. In Cuba, the hurricane knocked out electricity across the whole island on Tuesday. Two days later, only 10% of power in the capital city of Havana was repaired. Officials said at least three people died from the storm. Officials still do not know the full extent of the damage. The hurricane became even stronger as it traveled across the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico toward Florida. There, the storm destroyed properties, trapped people in flooded areas, and knocked out power to 2.6 million homes and businesses. At least six people in the state died from the storm. U.S. President Joe Biden said Thursday that Ian may be the deadliest hurricane in Florida's history. Immediately after the storm, scientists released a study saying that climate change might have added at least 10% more rain to the hurricane. The study compared actual rainfall during Hurricane Ian to 20 different computer models of storms that are similar in size and strength. The models were created in an environment with no human-caused climate change. The real storm was 10% wetter than the storm that might have been, said Michael Winner of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. The climate scientist is the study's co-writer. The latest study has not yet been examined by outside scientists. Winner and atmospheric scientist Kevin Reed published a study in Nature Communications earlier this year looking at the hurricanes of 2020. They found that during the hurricane's rainiest three-hour periods, they were more than 10% wetter than in a world without greenhouse gases trapping heat. Winner and Reed applied the same scientifically accepted method to study Hurricane Ian. A long-time rule of physics is that for every extra degree Celsius of warmth, the air in the atmosphere can hold 7% more water. This week, the Gulf of Mexico was 0.8 degrees warmer than normal, which should have meant about 5% more rain. The study found Ian dropped two times the expected amount, or 10% more rain in Florida. 
Reed said 10% may not sound like a lot, but that 10% means an additional 5 centimeters of rain fell in addition to the 50 centimeters that came down in Florida. I'm Dorothy Gundy. Thank you, Dory. Next, our arts and culture program. A new documentary series examines the worst mass shooting in American history through witness reports, videos, and other material. Eleven Minutes is a telling of the 2017 massacre at a country music festival in Las Vegas, Nevada, and how it affected people who were there. The film is more than three hours long and appearing in four parts on the Paramount Plus streaming service. I've never felt more useful or more like the universe put me exactly where I was supposed to be, said Ashley Hoff, a survivor of the attack and lead producer of 11 Minutes. She was at the outdoor show on October 1, 2017, with her husband, Sean. They were watching Jason Aldean perform when they heard gunfire. They first thought it was fireworks. But then, Huff saw a bullet hit another concert-goer in the face. She and Sean began running, dropping to the ground whenever they heard gunshots. At one point, Hoff kicked off her cowboy boots so she could run faster. She and Sean escaped to safety. The shooter, from high up in a hotel, killed 60 people and hurt more than 850 others. Nine months later, an FBI agent was at Hoff's door with her boots, part of a little-known team that returns property left behind in such incidents. Hoff, who was already in the film business, thought the property return was an interesting subject, but she soon expanded on the idea. Many survivors, like herself, were unhappy with media coverage of the shooting. They said they thought it was too concerned with the gunman instead of the victims. We all went back to our corners to suffer in silence, she said. The film describes the event with cell phone and police body camera recordings. The cooperation of Las Vegas police was important to the production. The police provided video that shows medical teams racing to get injured people to hospitals. The film also includes video of special police bursting into the room where the gunman had barricaded and then shot himself. The film presents the experiences of others at the event, including Jonathan Smith and Natalie Grumet. Both were seriously wounded in the attack. Is it easy to watch? No, but it shouldn't be easy to watch, said Sirius XM host Stormy Warren, who was on stage in Las Vegas that night. I don't know why you would tell the story if it were easy to watch. Warren did not immediately agree to be part of the film. He was dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of the attack. He also was not pleased with past media coverage on the attack. Hoff believes that her own experience that night even though it is not included in the film, helped persuade some of those involved to talk. After the shooting stopped, police talked of hearing the rings of cell phones, unanswered, as they walked among bodies 
still on the ground. Along with concert-goers, Eleven Minutes looks at the effects the violence had on emergency workers. I was a very angry man, very angry, paramedic operations chief Brian Rogers said in the film. Part 4 of Eleven Minutes begins at daybreak, October 2nd, 2017. It centers on some of the lasting ties made among survivors and rescuers. It is Hoff's favorite part of the series. I do like to encourage people that there is goodness in the end, so hang in for that, she said. There are extraordinary acts of courage and human beings helping human beings, said Susan Zurinsky, chief of the See It Now Studios production company. They're just regular people. In the darkest hours, people found each other. Zurinsky, a former CBS News president, produced the critically praised documentary 9-11 about the 2001 terrorist attack in America. She considers 11 Minutes the most powerful film she's worked on since. The gunman, who was dead when police reached him, was 64-year-old Stephen Paddock of Mesquite, Nevada. But the filmmakers purposely did not identify him by name. Days before the shooting, Paddock had searched the Internet for information on how to become a social media star. Hoff did not want to give the killer any publicity. The film ends by recognizing the names of victims of every mass shooting in the United States since the one in Las Vegas. I don't call it a political statement, Zerinsky said. I call it a statement of reality. Both Hoff and her husband escaped the show without any gunshot wounds. Hoff had broken her arm when she fell while running. That is when she left her boots behind. She did not notice her injury, however, until they reached safety. Hoff hopes the film shows the depth of damage caused by mass shootings. We need to stop turning away, and we need to understand what going through this was like, she said. It changes a person forever. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. Hello, this week on Ask a Teacher, we will answer a question from Caterina in Spain. She writes, Dear VOA, I have a question about something my American friend usually says. It is the expression, a wild card. What does it mean? Thank you very much for your answer. Take care, Katerina. Dear Katerina, thank you for writing to us. This expression is like many that come to American English from card games, especially the game of poker. Each set of playing cards has two extra cards. These can take the place of lost or damaged cards. These cards are called jokers. They often have a picture of a clown-like person, sometimes called a jester. In some card games, the joker card is dealt to the players along with the usual kinds of cards. It serves as a wild card in the game. That means if you have it in your hand, you can use it as any other card. Here is an example of how a player might talk about their use of a wild card 
in a game. I have three kings and one joker. I'll use the wild card as a king, so now I have four kings. But card games are not the only places you will hear the term wild card. In sports, we use the expression for a team that is invited to compete for a championship. For example, in American football, the best teams play each other at the end of the season in a series of games called playoffs. A few teams that might not have the best records are invited to play against the top teams. It is possible, if the wild card team is good enough, that it can win the championship. Here is an example showing how a wild card team won the championship of American football, the Super Bowl. In 2007, the New York Giants entered the playoffs as a wild card team, but they went on to beat the New England Patriots and win the Super Bowl. And, as you can probably guess, we use wild card to describe people as well. If a person is unpredictable, you cannot be sure of how they will act. Then you might say, My brother is a wild card when it comes to holidays. We never know if he is coming to our family dinners. Finally, in the world of computers, the term wild card describes a symbol that programmers use. It looks like a little star and is called an asterisk. It means anything can appear in that place. For example, if you want a computer to find all the words in a document that start with the prefix DIS, you can write a command, find DIS asterisk. The result will be a set of words like these, discover, discuss, dismiss, and the like. I hope this will help you understand and even use the expression wild card yourself, Katrina. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Jill Robbins. Thank you, Jill. And now, our series, American Stories. William Wilson, Part 2 In the first part of my story, I spoke about my life at my first school and about the other boys, over whom I gained firm control. But there was one boy who would not follow my commands, who would not do what I told him to as the other boys did. His name was the same as mine, William Wilson. Although he did not belong to my family in any way, he seemed to feel some love for me and had entered the school the same day as I had. Many of the boys thought we were brothers. I soon discovered that we had been born on the same day, January 19th, 1809. Wilson continued his attempts to command me, while I continued my attempts to rule him. The strange thing is that, although I did not like him, I could not hate him. We had a battle nearly every day, it is true. In public it would seem that I had been proved the stronger, but he seemed somehow able to make me feel that this was not true, and that he himself was stronger. Nevertheless, we continued to talk to each other in a more or less friendly way. On a number of subjects we agreed very well. I sometimes thought that if we had met at another time and place, we might have become friends. It is not easy to explain my real feelings toward him. 
there was no love, and there was no fear, yet I saw something to honor in him. I wanted to learn more about him. Anyone experienced in human nature will not need to be told that Wilson and I were always together. This strange appearance of friendship, although we were not friends, caused no doubt the strangeness of battle between us. I tried to make the others laugh at him. I tried to give him pain while seeming to play a light-hearted game. My attempts were not always successful, even though my plans were well made. There was much about his character that simply could not be laughed at. I could find, indeed, but one weakness. Perhaps he had been born with it, or perhaps it had come from some illness. No one but me would have made any use of it against him. He was able to speak only in a very, very soft, low voice. This weakness I never failed to use in any way that was in my power. Wilson could fight back, and he did. There was one way he had of troubling me beyond measure. I had never liked my name. Too many other people had the same name. I would rather have had a name that was not so often heard. The word sickened me. When on the day I arrived at the school, a second William Wilson came also, I felt angry with him for having the name. I knew I would have to hear the name each day a double number of times. The other William Wilson would always be near. The other boys often thought that my actions and my belongings were his, and his were mine. My anger grew stronger with every happening that showed that William Wilson and I were alike, in body or in mind. I had not then discovered the surprising fact that we were of the same age, but I saw that we were of the same height, and I saw that in form and in face we were also much the same. Nothing could trouble me more deeply, although I carefully tried to keep everyone from seeing it than to hear anyone say anything about the likeness between us of mind or of body or of anything else. But in truth I had no reason to believe that this likeness was ever noticed by our schoolfellows. He saw it, and as clearly as I, that I knew well. He discovered that in this likeness he could always find a way of troubling me. This proved the more than usual sharpness of his mind. His method, which was to increase the likeness between us, lay both in words and in actions, and he followed his plan very well indeed. It was easy enough to have clothes like mine. He easily learned to walk and move as I did. His voice, of course, could not be as loud as mine, but he made his manner of speaking the same. Ah, oh, how greatly this most careful picture of myself troubled me. I will not now attempt to tell. It seemed that I was the only one who noticed it. I was the only one who saw Wilson's strange and knowing smiles, pleased with having produced in my heart the desired result. He seemed to laugh within himself and cared nothing that no one laughed with him. I have already spoken of how he seemed to think he was better and wiser than I. 
He would try to guide me. He would often try to stop me from doing things I had planned. He would tell me what I should and should not do, and he would do this not openly, but in a word or two in which I had to look for the meaning. As I grew older, I wanted less and less to listen to him. As it was, I could not be happy under his eyes that always watched me. Every day I showed more and more openly that I did not want to listen to anything he told me. I have said that in the first years when we were in school together, my feelings might easily have been turned to friendship. But in the later months, although he talked to me less often then, I almost hated him. Yet let me be fair to him. I can remember no time when what he told me was not wiser than would be expected from one of his years. His sense of what was good or bad was sharper than my own. I might today be a better and happier man if I had more often done what he said. It was about the same period, if I remember rightly, that by chance he acted more openly than usual, and I discovered in his manner something that deeply interested me. Somehow he brought to mind pictures of my earliest years. I remembered, it seemed, things I could not have remembered. These pictures were wild, half-lighted, and not clear, but I felt that very long ago I must have known this person standing before me. This idea, however, passed as quickly as it had come. It was on this same day that I had my last meeting at the school with this other strange... William Wilson. That night, when everyone was sleeping, I got out of bed, and with a light in my hand, I went quietly through the house to Wilson's room. I had long been thinking of another of those plans to hurt him, with which I had until then had little success. It was my purpose now to begin to act according to this new plan. Having reached his room, I entered without a sound. Leaving the light outside, I advanced a step and listened. He was asleep. I turned and took the light and again went to the bed. I looked down upon his face. The coldness of ice filled my whole body. My knees trembled. My whole spirit was filled with horror. I moved the light nearer to his face. Was this, this the face of William Wilson? I saw, indeed, that it was. But I trembled as if with sickness, as I imagined that it was not. What was there in his face to trouble me so? I looked and my mind seemed to turn in circles in the rush of my thoughts. It was not like this, surely not like this, that he appeared in the daytime. The same name, the same body, the same day that we came to school. And then there was his use of my way of walking, my manner of speaking— was it in truth humanly possible that what I now saw was the result, and the result only, of his continued efforts to be like me? Filled with wonder and fear, cold and trembling, I put out the light. In the quiet darkness I went from his room, and without waiting one minute, I left that old school and never entered it again. And that's our program for today. 
Listen again tomorrow for another Learning English program on The Voice of America.